Our scripture passage today comes from the first chapter of Luke, verses 26 through 38, the Annunciation to Mary. Hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts not only be acceptable to you, but may we open ourselves to you so that your word can reach us at the deepest core of our being. In Christ's name, amen. Breaking news. No matter what news channel you follow or watch, it's become customary to break in with whatever program there is with the headline breaking news. Due to the 24-hour news cycle and cable news and the stiff competition, news organizations are competing for our attention with this breaking news. That's their latest version of a cymbal crash and a drum roll. Mary wasn't watching the news. She was living the breaking news. The angel Gabriel appears to her and says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, if the, Lord's, if the Lord God's top messenger angel appeared and greeted you in this way, how would you react? Well, we would react just like Mary. We'd be astonished and frightened. This is why Gabriel had to say to her after that, do not be afraid, Mary, because it was obvious <laughs> this was so surprising and shocking. He says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. But once he calms her down, he hits her with the mind-blowing, mind-blowing blockbuster news. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This must have been too much to take in. This was like the publisher's clearinghouse guy showing up with cameras in your front lawn and a huge check. It's even more astonishing, astonishing than that. I mean, Mary is told that she goes from being an unknown, insignificant young woman to the mother of the Messiah, ruler of an eternal kingdom. Let's take a closer look at Mary, because you know what? We have a lot more in common with Mary <laughs> than we do with her son, her superstar son. Mary was probably between 13 and 16 years of age. That was the common age of betrothal and marriage in their day and time. And I know this sounds very young to us uh, in our day, 
But in her day, that was a common time, 13 to 16. We know absolutely nothing about her to distinguish her from all the other young women of her day. But the first hint we have that anything is special about her is the announcement that God has chosen to favor her. Why did God choose Mary? We don't know. But we should learn something from this. God sees more in us than we see in ourselves. God believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. God saw more in Mary than Mary saw in herself. And God believed in her enough to entrust her with this special favor and task. So if God chooses you, if God asks you to do something, God is favoring you. God is giving you grace. Even if what God asks you to do or what God chooses you for requires great sacrifice and even suffering. God's choice is an act of grace and favor. Mary intuitively understood this as we can see in her song, The Magnificat, which comes just a few verses after our passage. Mary sings, He has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God's favor often has a purpose behind it. Now God loves us for who we are, just as we are, but also when God shows his favor in a special way and chooses something and asks something of us, uh, God has a purpose behind that. So when God chooses you or asks something of you, God is favoring you. What he's asking may be shocking. It may seem so challenging. It may be over the top, but it's an act of grace and favor to you. And Mary understood this. God's choice for Mary may have been a favor, but what God had in mind for her was truly mind-blowing. She will have a son, and she will call him Jesus, which means Yahweh is Savior, who will be a king in the Davidic line. He will be the Messiah. Now, in her wildest dreams as a young woman, in her wildest dreams, Mary never thought of being the mother of the Messiah. God may have plans for you that are beyond your wildest dreams. God believes in you much more than you believe in you. You know, when God called me to preach as the end of my freshman year of high school, I was sitting alone in a room in my home reading a book. And God interrupted my train of thought and said, Mark, be a preacher. I automatically knew in the core of my being that it was God speaking to me. There was no angel Gabriel there, but I knew that God was speaking to me. I'd never had an experience like that before. It was unique. God said, Mark, be a preacher. I was seeking God's will for my life at that time, so I was definitely open, but just out of the blue, the voice came. I wanted to be a medical doctor, but God had other things in mind for me. What message would the angel Gabriel have for you? What message would the angel Gabriel have for you? Don't say, well, I'm retired. I'm 80 years old or whatever age. My productive days are past. You know what? God is more interested in your present than God is interested in your past. Let's simplify it a little bit. What does God want you want to do through you and with you now i don't know but let's return to mary for a moment and see what we can learn let's pay attention particularly to how mary responds to god through the angel gabriel she's actually a model for how to respond to god i think there are three basic ways that mary responds that are wonderful guidelines for you and me that when we sense God uh, asking something of us or telling us something. First of all, when 
The angel announces this news to Mary and asks this of her. She shows no hesitancy. She doesn't hem, she doesn't haw, she doesn't offer objections like Moses did. He offered a whole string of objections. Mary doesn't do that. She accepts what will happen. She only wonders how in the world this is going to happen. I'm a virgin. How can I have a son? I'm betrothed. I'm not married yet. How do you respond when God, you hear God speaking to you or you feel the nudge, however, uh, in whatever way you sense God communicating with you? How do you respond when God asks something of you? Do you act like Moses and start giving excuses? <laughs> do you change the subject? <laughs> Most of us distract ourselves and take our minds off of it. Or do you, like I with my hearing aids, take my hearing aids out, I can't hear you. <laughs> Mary accepts, right off the bat, with no hesitancy, she accepts what God asked of her. <clears throat> Acceptance is the first act of response. And Mary was aware that this was going to change her life completely. I mean, the news was so startling and earth shattering. Uh, and she could not even anticipate all of the implications for her life. But she accepts what God asked of her without question or hesitancy. Boy, I would love to have my mind and heart trained and prepared for anything that God asked of me, no matter how small or how great to have no hesitancy to say, yes, if God says jump, I say, how high, you know? In our daily walk of faith, you and I are not asked to do monumental things. We're not asked to give birth to the Messiah or anything like that. We're not even, I'm not even called to preach. Or, uh, an experience like that doesn't happen all of the time. Uh, God asks small things of us. In fact, God would like us to do what we know to be right. I've actually adopted a, an a personal affirmation that I repeat to myself every day. I do what I know is right, rather than following my impulses or what feels good. I do what I know to be right. I don't have any question about it. It's not some moral dilemma on the basic things where I know basic right and wrong and what God wants. I say, I do the right thing rather than just following my feelings of the moment or my impulses. You know, most of the things God asks of us, we need to cultivate a hard attitude of acceptance and put ourselves in that trajectory of doing the right thing and accepting whatever God asks of us, even no matter how small it is. But once in a while, God will come along and challenge our socks off. Mary's second act of response after acceptance is cooperation. Mary cooperates with God's calling and plan, even though I don't think it made any sense to her at that time. She says, how can this be since I am a virgin? I'm sure she didn't understand what Gabriel told her when he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. That term for overshadow you is like when the, when the cloud of glory descends upon the temple. The, the, the Most High will overshadow you. She may not have understood, but Mary cooperated. She went along with it. She not only said yes, she followed through to do what was asked of her. Her response at the end of our passage today should be ingrained in all of our hearts and minds. It should be our reflex response to God. She says, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Isn't that powerful? When God asks something of us, no matter how seemingly insignificant or how grand it may be, we should follow Mary's example. We accept what God asks, but then we cooperate with God asks. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. The third way that Mary responds isn't in our passage, but we can see it as we read the rest of the gospel story. Mary follows through faithfully. 
She follows through faithfully. You might say that faithful follow through is sort of another way of talking about cooperation, but I think it takes it a bit step further because faithfulness is a form of seeing it through until the end. We don't just accept what God asks of us. We don't just cooperate with God, but we are uh, committed and persistent and consistent, and we follow through faithfully to the end. Mary was standing at the foot of the cross. We know that she followed through faithfully to the end. She never wavered in her cooperation with God. She never wavered in her trust in God. Her yes to God at the very beginning was consistent throughout her whole life. Now, I would like us to step away from Mary for just a moment and talk about LeBron James. What? <laughs> LeBron James was named Time Magazine's Athlete of the Year for 2020. We all know LeBron is a basketball star who brought the NBA championships to three different NBA teams, one of them here, the Orlando Magics. He's a superstar of superstars. But what most of us are not aware of is his early life. LeBron's mother, Gloria James, was only 16 when he was born, very close to the age that Mary was born, when uh, Mary was when Jesus was born. LeBron was born in the poorest part of Akron, Ohio. She struggled and struggled to make a living, and by the time LeBron was age five, she had already moved seven times. Now, LeBron's father was involved in different criminal enterprises and was in jail and out of jail, and he was basically totally absent and not involved in LeBron's upbringing. It was his mother, Gloria. But because of the instability of their home life and her love and concern for LeBron, um, when he was just nine years old, she allowed him to move in with the family of Frank Walker. Now, she let him move in with Frank Walker so he could have a stable family life. And Frank Walker was a local youth football coach. But uh, he's the one who introduced LeBron to basketball as just a young child. And LeBron uh, began, he started basketball at about age 11, but he began organized basketball in the fifth grade. And his stardom actually began as a very young player and went from there. You know, people don't become superstars on their own. There are always key people in their lives who help shape them as people, who keep them on track, and who also help hold them accountable. That character shaping, keeping them on track and, and accountability, are vital to develop a strong character and highly developed abilities to become a superstar, so to speak. So this is what LeBron's mother, as well as Frank Walker, and even Jesus' mother, Mary, have in common. Not many can be the chosen one, like Jesus or LeBron, but you know what? Many people can contribute to shaping lives. I don't care what stage of life you're in, you can influence and shape someone's life for the better. I think of my first cousin, Rebecca, who's about my age, who's been named Coach of the Year more than once in the, in the state of Texas. Uh, she coaches high school women's distance runners, and she has winning teams all of the time. But she doesn't, doesn't teach them how to run fast. She shapes their character, and she, she shapes their character, and she prepares them to be fine and upstanding human beings in this world. She helps them discover things in themselves that they're not even aware of, and to push themselves and learn how to develop themselves. I think of our preschool teachers in the Joyful Noise Preschool, of how they don't just teach reading and writing and math, they shape how children develop relationships, how they respond to challenges, how to get along with one another. I think of our prayer ladies who meet every Thursday, and they pray for the prayer requests that you put on your Connect cards. God's power is released through their intercession and lives are changed for the better. You and I 
have a lot in common with Mary. We may not be people of any fame or renown, anything particularly noteworthy about us, and yet God sees more in us than we see in ourselves. We need to take to heart the lessons from how Mary responded to God and build that into our life and how we respond to God when it's just the slightest hint and whisper or whether God decides to send the angel Gabriel to announce the good news and to give us the task ahead. So when God asks something of us, God is favoring us. God is showing God's love for us. God is giving us grace. But what God has in mind for us and the vision God has for us is greater than what we have for ourselves. But what God needs is for more people to follow Mary's example. We need to accept what God asks of us without question. We need to cooperate fully and unhesitatingly with God as we go through in our obedience. And then we need to faithfully follow through to the end of whatever it is God puts before us. So when God asks something of us today or sometime during the coming week, no matter how small or how large, let us say this along with Mary. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Let us pray. O oh God, it encourages us, inspires us, and scares us that you believe in us so much, that your vision for what you can do in our lives and through our lives is so much greater than our vision for ourselves. Oh God, may your vision become our vision. And God, may we follow Mary's example, that when you communicate with us in whatever form that communication may be, that we would accept right on the spot without hesitancy, without any hemming and hawing, without any waiting, without any question, that we would cooperate with you in what you ask of us, and then that we would faithfully follow through to the end of whatever it is you ask of us. Because your grace not only meets us when you ask something of us, your grace accompanies us along the journey, and your grace meets us at the end. Oh God, I pray that you would show us ways that we can shape other people's lives and help make their lives better. Whether it's something as simple as a touch or a smile, but it may be something much greater than that, God. It may be becoming a foster parent. We don't know what it would be. But God, uh, use us to shape other people's lives and help us to be open to the way you want to shape our lives for the other people around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.